again. Oh, don't, don't make it too long. Not just just, yeah. <laughs> just, just, just Tim for physics is already fine. <laughs> Actually, other side, sorry, Kat. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Uh, I'm Tom Gideon, I'm chairing this session, but it'll be mostly the uh, very brief introduction to Tim and then we'll hand over to him. Uh, Professor Jim Sendon is a graduate of the ANU from both his BS Beyonds in Physical Chemistry and his PhD in Atomic Force Microscopy. Uh, since then he's held positions in uh, France, UNSW Canberra before returning to the ANU uh, quite a while ago and is now director of the research school of physics and I'll hand over to Tim. Thank you very much and uh, look it's uh, I'm on good <laughs> thank you very much for the uh, the organizers charm Kath in particular for for uh, all the liaison over the last few months and I appreciate everything that the uh, the charming team has done so thank you. Um, so I'm a physicist. I'm not a medical uh, specialist in any sense, but uh, the question of 3D printing is intriguing to me, and, and it's one of those grand challenges, and it's, I guess that's the topic I want to uh, spend a bit of time talking with you about and, and getting your feedback too, because a grand challenge, in whether it's science or medicine, is a, is a direction. It's like infinity. Infinity is, is the direction of big numbers. Uh, a grand challenge is the direction of big discoveries. And what you find when you set a big challenge like, let's print an organ, um, that you discover a lot along the way, a hell of a lot, as it turns out. So let's start from the top. The, the topic given to me was 3D printing of organs. Where are we now? And it was something I covered uh, fleetingly last year. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, go back to some of those comments last year, but also look at uh, where we're going for the, the future. So the first thing you ask yourself is, what materials are you going to use in this construct, in this organ? Um, and where are they going to be located? Are they going to be located uh, inside the body or outside? You might also ask yourself, what sort of structures are we going to print? Um, what's, what's the target organ? Is it a lung? Is it a kidney? What is it going to be? Um, and more importantly, what's the relationship between form and function? So evolution in our, in our forms, in the tetrapod form that we walk in, is uh, really has given a chance for form and function to be a two heavily intermingled topics. Um, in science, particularly in, in fundamental science, we try, try and um, disentangle or disaggregate form from function. And that's a trap. I mean, because this reductionist approach in science means that we lose that fundamental connection that evolution has taught us is so important for life. What I love about 3D printing is this last line. It's the whole ex explosion of digital design and fabrication. And 3D printing encapsulates that. It's the flagship, if you like, of this revolution in the democratization of fabrication and design. Um, there are other design, uh, digital design techniques like uh, fabrication techniques like um, uh, you know, laser cutting and, uh, and milling and so on. But what you find in 3D printing is that way of freeing um, the fabrication process so anyone can involve themselves. And why is that important? Because when you have open discovery, when you have a process where anyone can involve themselves, you bring a lot more minds to a problem. 
and it's entirely what you need when you have a, a grand challenge. You need as many minds as you can assemble in one place and opening up that uh, front of uh, that fabrication opportunity really frees people to contribute in all sorts of ways and we really need everyone too because a grand challenge uh, needs every discipline we can, we can muster. So, I'll just recap a little bit on 3D printing, uh, update a little bit on the state of play of uh, 3D printing of, uh, 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 in the medical um, realm and then talk a little bit about how we bring the different disciplines together so that we get the form and function um, meeting together again in a purposeful way in a, if you like, a clinical setting. But we're, we're a long way away from that uh, end point. But let's, let's set up the framework so we can at least get there. So recapping on printing, um, for me at least, uh, this is an open area, but I, I like to divide these things into two types of uh, printing opportunities, and these are additive manufacturing processes, where rather than taking a lump of material and removing material, like you would in a lathe, you're actually depositing material and building an object up. So both these categories are in that additive manufacturing uh, realm, and uh, rapid prototyping or 3D printing, which is what you often hear it called, uh, is often a single material, but it gives you a functional form. It gives you something that's tough, can be used mechanically, or it might be elastic, but it, it's something that it gives you some functionality. Concept modelling, which is what I'm going to be using today, is entirely about illustrating a concept. It's often in colour, it's, it can be multi-material, um, but for me, it, it's where I come into 3D printing. I use 3D printing to explain um, and the nanoscopic or even the microscopic world, and, and to help people understand complex materials. So that's where we're going to go today, and they're the examples I've brought, brought in. But I won't limit it to that. And if we look at how 3D printing, this is a quick refresh of those who are not completely au fait with it, it's basically a, a two-dimensional process. When we talk about 3D printing, we're really layering materials in a um, successive two-dimensional way. And, and it's quite simple. There's three types, three general types. There's this uh, sintering of a powder, and it could be a laser and inkjet that sinters one surface, the top surface of a uh, bed of powder. And where the inkjet uh, lands its ink, or the laser fuses the material, that becomes solid, or at least uh, rigidified against the free-flowing powder that's around it. So as you um, print, the, the bed descends, and more powder is put on top. And slowly, as you print layer by layer, a structure emerges, or should say submerges, beneath a bed of powder. So the powder in this case acts to support that printed object, um, and that's, that's a very important aspect of this type of uh, powder-based printing. In the end, the object itself um, is uh, buried within a pile of powder. You reach in, dust off the powder, and, and typically that's, uh, that's the finished object. And particularly if you're using a laser, um, laser metal, uh, metal sintering is a very uh, mature, um, technology and you can get uh, near finished products from this, uh, this process. The technique I use is uh, using gypsum and, uh, and a poly uh, an acrylamer, uh, acrylic polymer and it uh, leaves uh, a very coloured but uh, uh, beautiful material. The next type is a spinneret or an extruder and there again you extrude onto a platen which descends and you slowly build up an object in free space. The problem with that, these objects are often not self-supporting, and so you need to build in some struts or some mechanical support which can later be broken away um, after the object is finished. Um, and then the, the final method is really a, a combination of the two in a way, and you're working on a free liquid surface, uh, often a, a, a partially polymerized polymer, and again, you, uh, uh, as the, the gel um, uh, uh, innovates, uh, uh, floods that object, you get uh, an object built up beneath a submerging liquid layer, and again, sometimes it needs to have struts to support it. So, just talking about the biological side of 3D printing then, there's, there's a couple of different types. Uh, the droplet-based type, where they use a bio-ink, um, uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about that, and there's some very novel uh, ways of uh, producing a free-flowing liquid, which immediately solidifies on contact with the structure that you're building up. Um, it's it's an area of uh, rich research, uh, research at the moment. It's a good way of just, uh, delivering a 
multitude of different cell types to a, a growing substrate, but the, the, complex, uh, the complexity in the structures is poor. Um, in contrast, the extrusion type uh, bioprinting um, is a bit slower, but the cell densities are uh, much, much higher. Uh, and so when we start to rely on things like stem cells uh, and, and other um, derived cells, then, then this can be a very important aspect. And you can also develop quite complex structures in that way. I'll say a little bit about the resolution in a moment. Now, the materials that can be printed, well, there's the uh, whole family of these extracellular matrices that can be um, produced, uh, generally not in combinations, generally as single uh, materials. Uh, alginate is a, a very popular one at present in the research area. Um, and for a long, long time, uh, these inorganic frameworks, the hydroxyapatites uh, and many other cer ceramics, uh, metals, of course, titanium has really come to the fore as, as have a, a huge range of um, stainless steels. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in the extruding type of printer, you've got nylon, ABS, some elastomers, and, and a small range of other polymers that can be extended. So these, these are things that all can, to some extent, be made biocompatible. Um, so in a sense, material science has a, a evolved to a stage where we actually can have a range of materials that can be implanted, if that was one path we wanted to take. In our case, in, in our lab, um, we work on the concept modelers, and we've got two types. This is a, a gypsum-based um, printer, and this is the, the newer acrylic-style uh, printer. And I'll just pass around some models, which I neglected to get out at the beginning, um, so you can see what we're talking about. There we go. Thanks, Kath. Now, these are mathematical models, and I'll say a lot more about them later on. There you go. Um, and there's many more examples I can show you <coughs> as we progress. Ah, this is a good one. Where did I put this? Now, this is the um, skull roof of a, an extinct placoderm, a 400 million year old fish. But what I wanted to illustrate there we can throw that around too, thanks. Um, is that the using colour, um, which I'm going to talk about, is an analogue for printing um, uh, cellular matrices or even cells, uh, can be used to uh, illustrate subsurface features. So in this case, I've decorated the surface of this object, uh, this skull in this case, with the sutures um, that lie beneath the material. And generally, you can't see those in the surface but we can paint them onto the surface. And it illustrates to you how you can take um, that inkjet delivery method, and if we, instead of using ink, we're delivering cells, you could deliver different cell types to within this porous matrix. So that becomes very interesting. If this is a matrix that can be removed by the body, resorbed, then you could leave a framework of differentiated cells through that entire matrix. That's a very interesting prospect. And I don't know, I've never read of someone do using that method to date. So something to discuss. Now, just a quick update on where we were. I, I addressed some of these things last year, but I think it's always worth to see the pretty pictures. The, um, really, in the, in the realm of medical application of 3D printing, prostheses and implants uh, rule the day, particularly the prostheses, external, externally worn prostheses. And you know the cosmetic prostheses for uh, ear flaps and noses and so on are, are really quite well developed. They're uh, disposable, um, and so uh, uh, that's one great advantage for the wearer, and that they can, uh, if they scuff their nose, they can just uh, get another one and, and wear it again. Um, of course, animals have been great beneficiaries, and more recently, some of the internal structural uh, implants have really take, come to the fore, and that's principally because of some of the advances in um, the laser sintered and metal processes. Um, there's still post-processing to occur once this is printed, but this is a bespoke object. This is built for the particular patient. So there's, there's some great advances in the area of prostheses and, and implants. Uh, we could spend the whole lecture just talking about um, that topic, and I won't, and I'll, I'll, leave it, I'll leave you with this image because, for me, it's one of the most remarkable aspects of 3D printing. This is what democratisation of a technology will do. So this is a voluntary organisation that's delivered um, bespoke hands and limbs to people around the world. 
Uh, it's a remarkable organisation. If you've not come across it, have a look at their website. It, it is really, truly amazing. And this is what happens when you put this technology in the hands of anyone. Now, when printing of organs first hit the, the media, of course, this wasn't in the mainstream scientific literature. This was, uh, this was a media event. And you saw all sorts of claims, you know, uh, people printing bion bionic ears. Notice that when this did come out as a scientific journal, it wasn't a medical journal. Um, and last year I covered some of those sort of um, uh, myths that was growing up in the industry. Um, what we saw last year was, and I just focused on two areas here, the development of vasculature, which of course is a critical part of printing a, an organ, you need to deliver fluids to it um, and, and away from it. So methods have been developed to try and develop a very fine capillary bed within an uh, extracellular matrix. And the state of the art last year was to use a laser writing process inside a, a matrix and then selectively remove uh, the path that laser described in 3D. I'll, I'll update that in a moment, but probably the most remarkable thing was this claim of um, working towards a 3D printed kidney. Now, it's great to have grand challenges and you need a spectrum of um, uh, media and re releases around that grand challenge, but to claim that this was in the direction of an artificial kidney was like saying a bowl of trifle is in the direction of an artificial kidney. This is not much more than a piece of jello with some very expensive stem cells um, randomly scattered through it. it. It's not an engineered product, um, but it caught some media, it developed some attention, and, and maybe that's a good thing. But for me, that's not really constructive or helpful uh, when we're talking about assembling the right people to achieve something with this grand challenge. More recently in the last year, we've seen a reduction in some of these wild media claims about uh, artificial uh, organs. And we've seen a focus on some of the components that might form artificial, component, uh, artificial organs. Uh, this one in the vascul vasculature line, uh, we've got uh, an approach where uh, Leon Bellin used a, a fairy floss model. Uh, he actually made fairy floss and embedded it in gelatin, then removed the, f the fairy floss. And that left, uh, if you like, an artificial capillary network as a, a, as a remnant of channels. The big problem is it's not bifurcating. It, it's just um, a somewhat overlapping <coughs> random mess of fibres. So that's nice. It's a, it's a good start. It's a great test platform for research, but it's not much more than that. This is much more serious. So in this case, this is an extracorporeal line that uh, William Faisal developed. He's used the, um, a, a semiconductor technology to make a, a nanoporous array of silicon on which he grows kidney cells. And the idea is that you'll have the physical, you'll have the biological and the physical filtration process in this extracorporeal line. Not bad, but a long way to go before that's used in the clinic. In the same line of uh, developing an organ on a chip, I talked a little bit about lungs. So for me, there are two target organs that are most likely to be um, the subjects of you know, a functioning, useful organ, either interior or exterior, and that's going to be the lung or the kidney, just by virtue of their, what we understand about their functions and how we might engineer it. So last year, I talked a little bit about um, microfluidic arrays, and what we see is that the, um, the process for making these very tiny fluid channels could be used to replicate uh, some of the function you see in the lungs. And it's, it's not really that clear, but basically if you have a, a bed of cells on a porous membrane, you can apply a vacuum on one side and cause, if you like, a breath, uh, a pressure differential to cause uh, an exchange of gas across that membrane. Fairly poorly uh, used in anything other than a research setting, but the guys over in Los Alamos have constructed uh, a miniature lung They've decorated this uh, microfluidic array with all sorts of cells found within the lung, and they can test, use it as a test bed to replace some of the animal models used in these uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases to, to um, basically get more rapid results. So it leads us to this question, how do we think about organs, okay? We could take the, the evolutionary approach, and we've got um, the design scope in evolution, of course, is to have some redundancy, some ability to grow the structure. It, it has to expand in volume. Um, but chiefly, it's an analog process. 
If we come to the modern digital um, context, what we are after is a disposable um, uh, object. Obviously, it's going to be fixed in size because we've got to build it. It can't grow. Um, and it's based around the digital realm. A lot to be said about that, and I'll come to that in a moment. When we look at the referee journals, and this is just, a, a, this is just two of um, hundreds of journals around tissue engineering and artificial organs, there's, a really, there's truly a rich biological science and research effort in tissue, tissue engineering, no question. But what we're finding is that these journals aren't overlapping with some of the other journals that we need to bring to, to bear on this topic particularly in maths, in physics, uh, and material science, to some extent. So last year, I, I sorted out, I think, a, an array from the literature of what steps you might take. And really, this is borrowed somewhat from the uh, tissue engineering uh, literature. But it shows you that you've got to, first of all, understand the structure you're trying to build. So you need very high uh, resolution histology, if you like, three-dimensional histology to achieve that. And to some extent, simulation, where you you can't get the resolution you need. Then you need to have a design approach. What are you building? Are you just copying nature? Or are you, you taking a different sort of engineering approach? You have to select the materials, of course. You have to select the cells. And there's a, a number of different approaches you might use there. And then if you're using 3D printing, and maybe you do, maybe you don't, you have to work out how you're going to do that. And of course, what's the end point? Is it inside the body? Is it outside the body? So I'll update that matrix uh, in a moment. But just focusing on what we do at the ANU uh, to give you some context of where we're going. If we look at um, structure elucidation, first of all, I'm a physicist. I like to build instruments. And I particularly like to build types of microscopes. And I've been associated with a group who's built a very nice micro CT system over the last few years. It's also been coincident with a group that's developed a, a range of advanced mathematics to look at the combination of form with function uh, at the, uh, the nanoscopic scale, typically. Um, one point here is that we've been talking about digital revolution and the, the ability to print in 3D. Um, some of the solution we're going to find if we're ever going to go in the direction of an artificial organ or even artificial tissue will be that it can't all be digital. So the lab that we, we work from uh, within the ANU is just underneath the John Curtin School. It's next to the electron microscopy unit, and it's a very nice imaging precinct. But basically, we rely entirely on this massive supercomputer that's on the other side. The techniques that we've developed are really uh, very, much like the C very much like the CT systems you have in, in the hospital here. Uh, except the, the algorithms are completely redefined, uh, redesigned and, of course, some of the hardware is, is a little bit uh, higher order. But basically, we can go from uh, a quarter of a micron resolution uh, up to um, uh, scan something about the size of a human head with about a 30 micron uh, resolution. So th these are the three types of instruments we've designed in-house. Um, happy to talk about those later on, but they're the tool that we need to bring to bear to look at some of the, the structure questions. Now this is a, um, we've got a project with Simon Foote, uh, at, he's the director of John Curtin School, to try and uh, understand the structural nature of an entire mouse kidney. And this is just a small fragment of the kidney. If I showed you the entire data structure, of course, you'd see nothing on this screen, because the very fine features are, are only, you know, sub 10 microns in scale. But the kidney, of course, is about the size of a kidney bean. So that gives you a sense that you've got to have a combination of high resolution and very large volume imaging. And that's, that's a complication in itself. Once you've got a structure, then you can fall back on the physics of what, um, um, what function drives that, um, that structure. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, the marry the form and the function together through a computational approach. And this is something I showed last year. It was a, a, a coral implant that we worked with a group in Singapore. It's used for facial reconstruction. And what I've done is I've uh, made the coral matrix, the solid part, invisible. And you're seeing just the, the channels in that matrix. And the flow lines are a computer simulation of how fluids, bodily fluids, would flow through that matrix. So if you look at the scale there, that's two microns. And that's an experiment we can't possibly do in the lab, but we can do in Solisso, in, in the computer. Um, and, and I'm advocating that an approach like that is what we need to be developing if we're going to develop uh, a path towards 
artificial organs. So, in physical properties, if we're talking about hard materials, rocks and uh, corals and all those sorts of things, we can um, develop computational models for fluid flow, thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity, all sorts of things. But when it comes to biological materials, there are very few things that we could simulate in Silisso, in the computer. Um, even just the complex flow of blood in a, a smooth capillary eludes us. We can't do that with any great numerical precision, least, let alone trying to work out the chaotic flow um, or turbulent flow inside a heart, um, particularly a pumping heart. So those things really elude us. And as a computational physicist, we need to develop greater tools where we can actually take advantage of the huge computational power we have around us. The weakness is that we just don't have the maths to approach it. I've put this up just to give you an illustration that even though you can print a material, and what this is is a, an implant in white that's been implanted into a, a pig model uh, done with a deep mar boot marker up at uh, QUT a long time ago, as it turns out. But what you see is the regrowth in the matrix around here actually doesn't connect to the parent bone. Sure, the, the, the bone grows, but it doesn't graft itself into it. It relies only on that thin uh, graft to, to form that physical uh, connection. And that's a problem. We have to wait until the, the, um, the implant dissolves before the bone has a chance to uh, grow and resorb and develop within the, the parent bone. Having said that, even if you've got that right, and after the, the, um, the implant uh, is uh, dissolved, you're left with a, a, a bony matrix which in no way is structurally strong. It doesn't reflect the same morphology of a strong bone. It's fine if you're doing facial reconstruction, but if you're doing a long bone, of course you need to have some uh, concentric uh, load-bearing nature, and the um, almost fi fibrotic nature of the reconstructed bone within that matrix just doesn't bear any weight. So just because you can print it, implant it, doesn't mean you're going to encourage life to um, adapt, adopt the same or the right morphology to actually form a functional, useful element. And that's just bone. Imagine if we're talking about something as complex and multicellular as an organ. <clears throat> So I've shown some beautiful animations, and, and I just wanted to reflect on this uh, genius here. Some of us in the audience know RJ LeMay. He works at the ANU for the supercomputer facility, and he's developed this open source visualization tool. I highlight it not because of the beautiful animation alone, but also because it's one of the quickest ways of getting to 3D printing your CT data. Uh, he's a, a brilliant advocate for open source. And again, as I said right at the beginning, if you have an open project, then you bring many more minds to bear on a problem. And RJ is a great advocate for that approach. Now, just to skip a little bit, let's go back to an organ. Let's say we wanted to build an organ. And it's a, obviously a multi-scalar, uh, multicellular thing. And, and I'm going to take the simplest organ that I know. I call it simple. Um, skin is in no way simple. Um, uh, but none of our organs are. And this is work done by a PhD student uh, within our group, uh, Miff Evans. Uh, and she was looking at really kerogen. And I'll, I'll, you, we all know the preeny finger problem. It's, it's, it was a bit of an enigma. Why, did this, why does the skin swell up? Why does it go crinkly? More importantly, why does it not lose its toughness? And why, and why is it still a barrier? So these are all um, fundamental material questions, but really with a, a deep biological uh, origin. So if we look at skin, and I'm not going to go into it much, but basically cells from the dermis migrate towards the outer layer, and as they go they become cornified, uh, dried out, desiccated, and the last layer of course is this dead cell layer, but it's very tough. And if you look at it with an electron microscope in the cells in this layer, at very high resolution you see lots of fibres. Now they're uh, kerogen fibres, um, or keratin fibres I should say, and they are uh, interwoven, uh, and if you take the right approach, the right 3D approach, you can see they're interwoven in a particular way. And Miff, being a great mathematician, said, oh, well, that's very interesting. I can simulate that. I can look at the form of these fibres, and then I can actually simulate their toughness and their um, permeability and all the physical properties associated with it. So she took this very complex mathematical model, which is a whole lot of intertwined spirals of keratin, and as you swell it, as you would with water, 
the material expands, and what happens is that these keratin uh, helices actually just straightening. So the stress is distributed uh, along the length of the fibre. So you don't get these um, problems that you have where you have a linear structure. If this was just a sheet or just a, a single layer of helices, you'd find that there's an anisotropy, anisotropy anisotropy, anisotropy in uh, the stresses within that material because there was a particular layering. This is a way of removing those stresses and uh, distributing them more uniformly through the material. It keeps its toughness in other words, but it's a, compli it's a, uh, it's a complicated configuration of helices. Um, now this is something that we've used in engineering all the time, um, that sort of um, method for distributing stress and strain. Um, but it's a point where maths and physics comes together. The missing element is the biology. And, and MIF was attempting to connect these two back into the biological observation. Along the way, she discovered a whole lot of other structures and they all have unique physical and elastic um, permeability pro uh, properties. They can all be simulated, and, but they're all derived from uh, a set of mathematics that she helped de uh, derive with her supervisor, Stephen Hyde. Stephen Hyde shown here. Now Stephen's a remarkable man and in many ways he should be talking to you today because he understands the nanoscopic world as it translates to the mesoscale and the microscopic world better than anyone in my view. He's a mathematician, he's a geometer and he's taken these tools of mathematics to describe a very beautiful uh, thing. Those of you who have seen uh, the iridescence on, on butterfly wings would know that it's a consequence not of a dye or a pigment but of a, a structure. It's, it's what we call a photonic crystal. And under an electron microscope, greatly magnified, you can see that this, is, this porous structure has a regular array, it interacts with light, and it scatters or refracts light in a particular way. It's a, it's a brilliant use of, um, it gives you a very structurally strong material, and uh, of course it has a function. It's probably a, um, um, a heat reflector as much as anything, but the question, the jury's still out on that. So this is a, s a situation where, um, under electron microscopy, we could replicate this structure, we could then model it, and I've brought it along because what I'm illustrating here, although it's a 3D printout, what I want to do, I'll pass it around. This is a structure where the elements which refract the light are about 100 nanometers. Now, I've magnified the structure there a million times, so you can see it and appreciate it in its, in its glory. If I was to do the same thing with the actual animal, it would be 30 kilometres high. Now that's quite startling. If you think about 30, a 30 kilometre high, well in fact I've lied to you, it's not mothzilla, it'd have to be butterflyzilla, but it's nonetheless, it's a remarkable animal and it wouldn't actually have enough atmosphere to flap its wings. Conversely, rather thinking about the huge scale of it, shrink yourself down to a bacterium, okay? So if you were a bacterium, you'd lie pretty much across the width of that, the length of that structure, okay? So this is a very important concept. Scale is terribly important. If we're going to print something digitally, we need to have enough length scales that we can pr print at high resolution, but a big enough volume of it to be useful. At the moment, we don't. The, the biggest sort of structure we could pre present would be maybe a thousand, and I'm, I'm talking roughly, but let's say a thousand by a thousand by a thousand elements. That wouldn't produce really um, a tiny fraction of one of these tiny scales here that produces the refractive light. To print a whole sc uh, scale, you'd need something like 10,000 by 10,000 by 10,000 elements. And we just don't have printing technology that will give us that sort of digital complexity. Not yet. Um, if we're going to print an organ, we need something that might actually be 100,000 by 100,000 by 100,000 elements. So we have to think carefully about how we do this. So one topic that we had last year was um, can we, and I've, I'm sometimes asked this uh, when I'm interviewed, is 3D printing a risk? Yes, we can print guns. That, that is a genuine risk. But we're not printing drugs. Why aren't we printing drugs? Well, that's the realm of chemistry. This is a molecular thing that we're talking about. So, but we can use molecular interactions to direct the way we fabricate, but at a scale smaller than we could control reasonably with 3D printing. So the two come together, the chemistry and the, the material science comes together in the way you design the chemicals to take advantage of the molecular interactions 
and the fact that you can fab fabricate something on a large scale. So a quick bit of physical chemistry, that's my background. Um, there's a class of molecules many of you will know about called surfactants. Lung surfactant is a, a classic example. It's the thing that actually gives, it's the material that gives us the ability to uh, absorb and exchange gases as effectively we have, uh, as we can. The alveoli, alveoli within our lungs, of course, give us a very large surface area, but that surface area is tiny compared to the surface area uh, these surfactant molecules grant us when they're in, in our lung. I'll show you some pictures in a moment. There are two types, there's the, and they basically look like this. There's a head group, which is either likes to be in the water, and the tail that likes to be in the oil uh, side, or, other way around, there's a head that likes to be in oil, and the tail that likes to be in water. So these molecules, of course, we use every day when we wash our hands, but uh, they're in, entirely um, present through life, and if it wasn't for this partitioning between oil and water, things that don't really mix, these uh, if it wasn't for these molecules, in fact, life would not exist. We rely entirely on the fact that these molecules can separate a polar from apolar solvents uh, to give us the partitioning we need to, to actually do what we do at every level. Depending on the shape and size of the molecules, you can create different structures, uh, and life has taken advantage, full advantage of these dif different structures. Um, from flat structures all the way to uh, structures that are hollow, look like cells, to, to what we call micelles, which are spheres. Now for a little bit of maths. Sorry, I can't avoid it. I have to do it. If we've got a micelle there, and, and really, if I have to, eventually I have to rely on the mathematicians because they give me so many ideas that I can develop in the lab. If I develop them in the lab, then I can bring them to the bench. And so that's, that's part of the process of discovery. So the micelle, the little sphere or spherical aggregate of these surfactant molecules, um, can be described simply as a bundle of cones um, with the tails pointing in, the, the apices of the cones pointing into the centre and the head groups on the outside. So that, that little ice cream cone has dimensions and those dimensions give me a number, G. And it turns out, in fact this is a very, very famous paper, one of our most famous papers at the ANU is this one, it describes how if we measure that ice cream cone and change the shape and size of the ice cream cone, we can predict what sort of structures those molecules will make. Terribly important if you're going to fabricate something at the nanoscopic scale. And knowing that, you can make wonderful structures. The, the, the first two structures I passed around are called hyperbolic structures. And they're very interesting because they partition um, if you like, oil on one side and water on the other side of a very complex structure. It's a very convoluted surface, but it keeps those two parts separate. And if you line that surface with the surfactant molecules, you find that these structures, and I've just shown you a small part here because it's an extremely complex structure, is a very beautiful structure, but basically these channels, these oil-filled channels here, are separated from the water-filled channels on the red side. Terribly important, as I say, because life has been using that trick for the last, let's say, 500 million years or more, both in the animal and the plant kingdom. If you want to create a battery, the thing that gives you the most power is the surface area of the electrodes. So the batteries in our mobile phones have a very high surface area. They're designed that because you can have a very high current that passes across um, that, that surface, that convoluted surface. Biology has gone one step further. It's packed so much surface that it can create a mitochondria, the powerhouses of our cells, um, into a tiny, tiny volume of just, you know, a few hundred nanometers. But that convoluted surface, a hyperbolic surface exactly like the one I passed around, is what creates that internal surface area that gives us the high energy capacity of that, uh, that organ, that organelle. And plants have dealt, developed, obviously, the same strategy for harvesting light. So this is where maths crosses over into biology. We can use some of these structures that are now richly understood by mathematicians to describe some of the structures that are becoming well understood by biologists. The beautiful thing about maths is that once you develop the mathematical language to describe these structures and the computational tools to work out how fluid flows around them, how heat transfers through them, how light interacts with them, then what remains is how do you develop methods to 
build with them, to fabricate with them. We're not going to be using a 3D printer, but we could use a 3D printer which is loaded with the right surfactants so that when they assemble, they develop structures on the nanoscopic scale, but in a macroscopic object. So then in one go, you've combined an analog approach, which is the evolutionary approach, with the digital approach, our modern human created approach, and you've put it in one space. To this date, we haven't done that. That is an open question for 3D printing. How do you combine self-assembly with fabric digital fabrication? So just sort of wrapping up, last year I, I picked some winners. I looked at that matrix of uh, um, uh, tissue engineering, how, how we might develop the, the, the six different groups of scientists, mathematicians around these different steps, and what would be the key steps that might lead towards an implantable, even uh, a wearable organ. And so these, this is my best guess based on what I knew at the time. Um, so I think pluripotent stem cells should still be there. I, I think they have great hope. It's you know, over a decade since the Nobel Prize was awarded in the area. There's still no clinical application of them, but gee, we've learned a lot about biological science from them, uh, and we'll learn a lot more too. That's where I put my money. And so this year's bet would be that we combine the 3D imaging techniques we have, the MRI with the CT. We, we then rely on simulation to give us length scales that we can't possibly image. I'm still a bit confused about what we might use there, but I think a combination of 3D printing and self-assembly is the way to go. What materials we use? Well, you know, that's an open question. Um, I like the extracellular matrix approach, personally, um, but I can see why you might want to use some silicon technology as well. Stem cells, without a question, and now the US have opened up the opportunity to um, hybridise human stem cells with animal cells, an animal genetic material, we're going to see some incredible uh, biological, fundamental biological science understood. Hmm. Clinical outcomes, well again, that's the, that's the topic for, a, for an expert to talk about, but you know, I think we're going to learn some fundamental stuff that's terribly important. What sort of printers we use? Well, look, I'm, I had put my money on centred approaches, but if we're talking about um, soft tissue, then I might go for the extrusion approach now. You can actually combine the two. There is a, um, an emerging area that actually sees these two technologies fused together, so maybe that's the way to go. Um, and then my money is still on the ex vivo. I, I think in the future we'll be wearing ex lungs on the outside. I think our kidneys will be wearable kidneys. Uh, I don't think they'll be Im implants. There's a lot of things to, to get over, you know, not least the ethics of it all. Um, but there's a lot, lots of hurdles to implant something uh, inside someone. Uh, and so for me, there will be a social constraint on where we go in this step six. It will be more sociological than technological. So just to finish, what, what's needed in the end? Well, of course, you know, I've, I haven't, I'm not being flippant when I say biology, physics, engineering, and maths have to come together. Um, there's no question we need to know more about the biology that we're studying. We need to merge the structure with the um, function, the form with the function again. Um, you know, engineering is probably uh, much further de down the path of developing new materials than, and th than these other two fundamental areas up here. We still need to understand so much more about it. And then I'm hoping as we understand more about the biology and the crossover between form and function, we can rely more on computational model modelling to give us analogues and understanding of how to design these new uh, materials, these new organs. My big issue is that I don't think we're bringing the right communities together. Uh, so a grand challenge is that hope to bring communities together. The, the brain, the whole brain imaging projects both in the European Union and, and in the US are wonderful examples of grand challenges. They come under criticism, criticism because they are costly, um, but they are trying to bring the right communities together around a central uh, topic. In the end, you know, I, I made the comment about sociology, uh, or, um, uh, ethics in a way, dictating how we apply this technology. In the end, I don't think it's going to be the printing technology. It's not going to be the engineering that holds us up. It's the fundamental science on one end, and of course it's the application, the clinical um, uh, realisation on the other end. So I'd, I'd like to acknowledge the, um, the organisers of the conference. Thank you very much and for the invitation to talk today. 
and, uh, and these are some of the organisations that supported our work at the university. And remember, we've just done one small part, tiny part of step one, of what would have to be a very large six-part grand challenge. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Tim. Fantastic talk. Um, we have time for some questions, so please. Uh, who'd like to be the first cab off the rank? Okay. Thank you. Oh, entirely right. So our, our organs, I mean, if you look at the shape of, so let's say a liver, let's take a liver as an organ. The shape of a liver in, in a, a mollusk or the shape of a liver in a tetrapod like us, they're different, okay? So, that, you know, sh shape really doesn't matter. It's really about the function. And so I, I really like the idea of these extra corporeal sort of um, organs, wearable kidneys, wearable lungs, for me, are, are where I'd be putting my research investment. Um, they're both systems we, we understand and we have, you know, we already have clinical practice that illustrates how they might work, except the machine's too big, we can't wear it. If we change the scale that we think at and, and we can get the plumbing to work, that's a key thing, if we can get the plumbing to work, because we can't, it's hard to put another pressure drop in a, a system like that. We have to be careful about the uh, impact we have on our own circulatory system. But, we can design materials now, um, some of this, you know, the, the hyperbolic surfaces I've passed around. If we could fabricate those, they would have a much greater exchange efficiency than anything we could do uh, in the clinic now, but in a much smaller space. So the mitochondria is my great example of where that works well. A mitochondria, an organelle in nearly every cell, um, produces most of the power for the cell, most of the chemical power. Um, but its surface to volume ratio is much, much, much higher than we can produce just in a flat um, permeable membrane. So if we learn to sculpture and, and convolute a surface, then we can make the machine, the dialysis machine, much more compact. Because um, it's about what limits the dialysis machine in this case is just surface area. So if we design our materials correctly, we can fold it up just as we fold up optics in our mobile phone. We can fold up the materials into a volume which is tiny. And, and then we've got to deal with pumps and power supplies and things like that. Uh, if we could free ourselves of electrical pumps and work on biological pumps, things that are driven by ATP and sugar and those sorts of things, then we're really starting to think more like, um, you know, biology's, what, what biology's taught us for the last 500 million years. So, so uh, my money's on wearable organs as being the first, uh, first option for us technologically. Yeah. So. Another question, Bruce. You may. I was fascinated by your presentation. We're in a health in flux. We're a health that really needs to be improved through breeds and regeneration and all of these issues. I was interested in your skin example that you, you've got. Did you ever think about looking at older people as their skin starts to degenerate and mathematics and modeling <coughs> It's a really good point, and, and uh, Miff, Miff Evans, who was the PhD student who led that work, um, she's starting to look at dermatitis, um, so, you know, d diseased skin, because there might be signatures for, um, you know, in the mechanical properties of the skin itself, it's, you know, they're almost certainly a consequence of the underlying microstructure, or the ultrastructure of the skin. It, so there might be clues about how that structure swells, um, the mechanical rigidity, you know, all those sorts of things that we can measure in a in a clinical setting, but we can put in terms of a, a molecular context. So I, I think that's 
for me, MIF's work is really revolutionary because it takes abstract maths and beds it in real function um, and, you know, and I think applicable to you know, a clinical setting. So, look, I can give you MIF's details. I know she's very keen to pursue that, that application. Exactly right. So, so again, a sociological rather than technological issue in a way. Um, you know, if you could make a um, portable dialysis machine that was, it had a lot, you know, a one-month lifetime. You know, the cartridges, the filtering, filtering cartridges had a one-month life. Then, you could have an internal monitoring. You could exchange them, uh, you know, like you do in your coffee machine, uh, once a month. You know, um, so there are ways you technology might get around these deficiencies. Uh, life is sustainable. You, you, you put the right energy in, you, you've got a very viable uh, structure for quite some time, but mechanical things, chemically based things are um, rather fragile and prone to failure. So yeah, there's some things that we've got to overcome, for sure. Next question. Please. Again. Yeah, so, so transplants uh, are a fabulous thing. If you can work out how to use pluripotent um, cells and take your own cells and do a, an auto-transplant, then, yeah, that's going to be great. You've still got a problem with maturation. So even if you take the, if you take the right cells and, and culture the kidney cells, the stem cells, to grow a kidney, you've still got to worry about how it integrates because, you know, we, we grow as embryos, then we, you know, become, you know, we're born and we we grow and lengthen and there's lots of mechanical and uh, growth stimuli stresses on that organ um, over life. How do you simulate that in a, in a jar before you implant it? So, look, I think you're right. I think for me, if you know, the whole art, the science around uh, auto implantation, that's going to go a long way. Um, it's probably not going to deal with whole organs very soon. It's probably going to deal more with tissues and the pluri pluripotent cell study that was done in Japan, um, led by some of the people that were associated with Nobel Prize, was to replace some of the uh, retinal cells in someone's eye who was suffering macular degeneration. It didn't quite finish as a clinical study. Um, it had some promise, but probably that approach to auto-transplantation is going to be around uh, replacing glands and specific tissues like retina um, rather than whole organs in, in the near future, because you have the problem with maturation and, and growing it. You know. How do you grow an organ? Does it does it still look like a kidney if you grow it in a jar? Yeah, it probably may, it, maybe it, it doesn't. Yeah. Next question. I, I had a question which is related to actually the first question because you were talking about these wearable organs. Um, would you still recommend that they would be outside? Even if you could make one that's smaller and would fit into the space and we'd have space left over, would you still advocate them being on the outside? Um, yeah, I, I guess for the whole question of sustainability and, uh, and maintenance, um, yeah, it'd be fine to have a little cleft, you know, in your uh, pleural cavity. You could actually, you know, <laughs> open, unzip it and open it up. Uh, you know, it'd be an interesting sort of uh, bit of... Uh, um, yeah, Velcro or something, whatever, you, I don't know what you'd use, but so, yeah. so there, there's a, there's a technolo technological challenge here and of course we, people wear um, uh, ports all the time, so you know, there, there is a way we can interface the interior and the exterior on a regular basis, that technology is developing and it's, you know, r rather mature. How we create a, um, a maintainable cavity, body cavity, is another challenge. Yep. Um, and, you know, it might not be a cavity, it might be a fluid filled sac. So th th there are other ways of dealing with it, you know, because you could deal with the movement of the body. You can't just be an airfield sack. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it'd be rather awkward to wear a dialysis machine on your hip. I mean, people with colostomy bags, of course, wear things on the outside. Um, but they're, you know, they're soft, deformable. They're not hard pieces of machinery. I don't know. Good question. What would you want to do? Would you uh, want to wear it on the inside or the outside? 
<laughs> Could get caught on doorknobs as you're going around corners. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I lost <laughs> perfectly right and if we free ourselves from this sort of electromechanical world that we live in and working with biological pumps and things that are actually um, themselves soft analogues of soft tissue then yes I agree with you entirely and, and just because your kidneys are you know here doesn't mean you have to orient the kidney there you've got a blood supply through your whole body and you could put you could put the artificial kidney wherever you want uh, in the middle of your back it could you wouldn't put it in the front of your head but you know <laughs> you could wear it like a hat I mean there's all sorts of things and, and, and you know, artists and technologists when they come together come up with these solutions, you know, so. Is there any final time for questions? Uh, Tim, thank you very much for the fantastic talk. I think you've blown all our minds. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Lovely. <laughs> Thanks. That's lovely. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, for it.